idea of shape shifting and how that may occur uh, as far as our, our endpoint here, our, our common endpoint, um, and also the computer technology that allows us to pattern these theories and perhaps bring us our own notion of authorship due to that and what that means for our own flesh transformation. Yes, well, in a way, I think these new technologies of information retrieval and uh, virtual realities and this sort of thing are simply the engineering mentality following along behind the shamanistic intent and putting it in place in silicone and glass and so forth and so on. Uh, the, The persistent rumor in real off-river Amazon psychedelic shamanism is of this fluid, this stuff, which you can generate out of your body under the influence of these uh, compounds that is this translinguistic matter, this mind, this spirit matter amalgam, which you literally give birth to out of your own body. In the fo- and, and what the claim is that's made for this stuff is that it's like... Uh, it's like... Um, a collapse of ordinary geometry. There are stars inside this stuff. You can also look into it and see who stole the pig. (laughs) You know? You can look into it and you can see how the fishing would be if you moved up river. It's a cybernetic, trans-dimensional medium of some sort that is generated out of the the mysteries of the physiology of the human body. Well, God, this is so far off the beaten track from anything in the Western repertoire of conception that we just gape at the notion. And it's not... It's hard to get confirmation, but what they say... See, ayahuasca is all about group mindedness, states of group mind. It's also, uh, when you analyze it chemically, it's brain soup. There's nothing in ayahuasca that isn't in your brain as we sit here. It's made out of DMT and it's made out of beta carbolines like harmine and harmaline. These things all occur naturally in your brain. So, uh, in these off river tribal situations, people take it all in a group, and when the boundaries dissolve, there is a group mind present that is able to make decisions. And uh, the, the, the shape shifting and the mystery of who, who was it? We were just talking about the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. This is the fallacy which haunts the Western mind. Uh, for the shaman, you know, attention gathers energy to itself. And so you can create a projection. So the mystery, I think the mystery of shamanism and the mystery of the psychedelic experience is a mystery of language. How can we... We are imprisoned by language, and yet it should be our vehicle for liberation. And something has happened to our language through the phonetic alphabet, through the abuse that print has laid on to our thinking. You all probably know the ideas of Marshall McLuhan, who felt that the linear quality of print created such notions as the citizen, uh, the industrial assembly line, the theory of interchangeable parts, uh, a whole bunch of conceptions which we take totally for granted are in fact adumbrations of the shift of sensory ratios caused by an unexamined acceptance of the printed word. The you know, one thing probably worth talking about this morning is how do you get, is there hope 
in all of this. And some people find my rap very ambiguous because this meltdown point in 2012, which we slapdashedly sometimes refer to as the end of the world or uh, so forth, seems... uh, uh, number one, irrational, number two, despairing. Well, I don't think we can do too much about its irrationality. But I think uh, living in the light of the expectation of something like that orders your priorities. And in case you didn't notice, we all have our own mini-apocalypse built right in. Uh, You may miss the end of the world, but you definitely are going to have a front row seat for the end of your world. (laughs) So, uh, you know, is that any less profound? Are you such a selfless Democrat that you're more interested in the end of the world than the end of your world? (laughs) I think it's a sort of light-hearted way to follow the Tibetans into the notion that life is a preparation for uh, the big D, although we don't have to think of it like that. We just say life is preparation for the inevitable collapse of the state vector into a biological hyperspace. I, I heard a doctor on NPR last week, and they were talking about cancer or some, something, anyway, something where a lot of people die. And he was saying, uh, yes, well, it isn't easy to prepare people for the mortality experience. And, and the interviewer said, did I understand you to refer to death as the mortality experience? <laughs> I thought that maybe that's a, 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 a good um, a good idea, uh, you know, kind of soften the blow. It's just one more experience. Well, someone asked when we first went around to try and talk about the future. Uh, I don't know if I made the point uh, strongly enough. I, I wasn't sure I felt it click. Um, and I think it's a strong one and it's somewhat new with me. It's this idea that um, our uh, that we represent some kind of singularity or that we announce the nearby presence of a singularity, that the evolution of life and cultural form and all that has, is clearly funneling toward something fairly unimaginable. I mean, I really don't think we can imagine our future because when we try to project some little science fiction scenario of our future, we inevitably select a very small number of trends and then we propagate them forward without integrating the forward propagation of everything else that is going to be happening simultaneously. Uh, You know, there are options such as nanotechnology, the building of super tiny machines. Uh, Space migration was once an option. This seems to be fading. It seems to have been written off the menu by the powers that be. As the Soviet Union cracks to pieces, the human race's ability to leave this planet becomes a memory of ancient times. I mean, we could not return to the moon in less than 15 years if we committed ourselves to it uh, tomorrow. So the space thing seems to have been taken off the agenda. There's nanotechnology, there's virtual reality. Uh, The present solution seems to be this enforced larval neoteny on the consuming blue-collar masses in the high-tech societies and triage through epidemic disease and mismanagement uh, in the third world. Uh, I, you know, it's a huge mix, this problem of saving the world or halting the forward thrust into catastrophe. Uh, Somebody asked me once, they said, well, why, you're always talking about saving the world, why don't you ask the mushrooms how to save the world? And I, uh, I had never actually done that. And I I did it recently 
and it, the results were very interesting. I don't often get messages from the mushroom that I quake to bring into the public arena, fearing an avalanche of political criticism. But uh, when I asked the mushroom how we could save the world, it hesitated approximately a third of a second, and then it said, every woman should bear only one natural child. An idea which had never occurred to me, actually which I now have looked into. I'm the father of two children, by the way. Um, this is a very interesting notion. The population of the earth would drop by 50% in 40 years without war, pogrom, displacement of populations, so forth and so on. The, another interesting thing about this suggestion from the mushroom is uh, it requires very little input, impact, or management by men, this suggestion. W women have been powerless for millennia. Uh, now, apparently, here's a suggestion of how they could take great power without asking any man's permission. It's not quite accurate. It's not quite accurate. We'll it's get actually practically not that accurate at all. Oh, well, tell me why. <laughs> well, because there's, there's two reasons, I would say. For, from a practical standpoint of being a woman who's still fertile, and one is no birth control is 100% effective. And yes. It, is that it? No, and the second one is, is that there are women in a lot of situations for economic reasons and political reasons where there are men. It's just like there's men all over the country sort of bombing abortion clinics. So I don't, to me it doesn't seem accurate to say well, let me, in the hands of women. Let, let me try and convince you. Um, I took this simple suggestion, each woman should have one natural child, and I began looking into it. Uh, and... Uh, then I found a demographer who told me what I consider to be the second piece of this puzzle. And this I had never thought of. Uh, a, a woman who has a child in, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan or Malibu or Berkeley, that child will have 800 to 1,000 times the negative impact on the caring capacity and resources of the earth of a child born to a woman in Bangladesh because of the difference in material culture, you see. Well, now that implies to me that if you wanted to make a social change in the area of the impact of the human population on the earth, then you should not preach contraception and birth control in the back streets of Dhaka and Lahore, you should preach it in Malibu and Berkeley and Manhattan. Now, the interesting thing about that is that these are the people, these women are the people you are most likely to convert to your point of view. They are college educated, comfortable, uh, all the resources of media are available to them. They are informed, intelligent, educated, healthy people, able to self-involved people. And so you can come to these women and you can say, here's the deal. Uh, we want you to follow a course of action which will increase your income, your disposable income, increase your leisure time and propel you to the forefront of political heroism without contest, you see. Now, the use of resource by these populations, these women and their children, is so intense, the pyramid is so steep, that uh, your objections about birth control isn't effective and, and so forth... 
I'll bet you that if you could get 15% of the women in that population to commit themselves to this one natural child thing, that within 10 years there would be a measurable margin of relief on the extraction of world resources. So that here is a way to back away from the abyss without... Uh, you know, nightmarish reorganization of society, engineered diseases, third world triage, all this other stuff. And in the first 40 years, the population would fall by half. Then the next 40 years, it would fall by half again. Uh, the amount of wealth that would be accruing to those still alive everybody would be would see their standard of living rise quite naturally as a consequence of uh, the falling pressure on resources. Now, why is this, if it's such a great idea, not being done? It's Here's why, as far as I can figure out. It's because nobody can figure out how you make a buck in that situation. All the men have bad estimates after they've fathered one child. Well, well, yes, the method, how you achieve it, is debatable. I think men should cooperate with the effort, but the, the point is this one natural child per mother. Now, you see, um, the first argument you hear is that this is bad for children, and, and uh, that... Uh, but the average American family is under three children. Most people have two children. Now, what's the history of having two children? Having two children has nothing to do with traditional family patterns or human child rearing. Two children is a compromise between the natural family of six to eight and the demands of the Industrial Revolution and the guilt of Christian civilization. Two children is a horrible number of children to have. Mostly when you have two children, they fight like cats and dogs. And uh, it's just a, a horrible compromise between the way people used to have huge extended families and uh, the industrial revolution's uh, preference for you're having actually as few children as possible to make you a more efficient worker. Well, this is a, a peculiarly nuts and bolts suggestion. It's not airy-fairy at all, and yet it would work. And it's the only other thing I've thought of besides mass dosing of the population with psilocybin that uh, seems to be a humane way to put the brakes on because we have real problems, folks. Don't, I mean, we are very insulated, but if you saw the data on the ozone hole last week, you know, they've been wailing about the ozone hole for five or six years, saying that it's disappearing at a rate of 4% a year. Well, then last week they announced that 40% of it disappeared in the last six months. This should have been, you know, a special meeting of the United Nations with all heads of state attending a complete emergency. Instead, you know, who Bill Clinton is screwing pushed it off the front page. I mean, this is the kind of shit for brains society that we're living in. So, uh, you know, we have real problems. And I have never heard a plan for pulling back from the abyss that had less coercion and less ideological freight to it than this one woman, one child thing. You see, it doesn't address politics. It addresses biology. It is overpopulation is what's driving us crazy. All other problems, toxic waste disposal, epidemic disease, resource extraction, degradation of the environment, collapse of the atmosphere, inability to satisfy third world aspirations, uh, all of these problems are population problems. And uh, capitalism doesn't want to talk about it because capitalism is not a human being. Capitalism is a Moloch, a god, 
a, a, a god of bloody sacrifice that sees human beings as ants. And the more ants there are, the more offerings there can be to Moloch. But this is not a good situation for us ants. And, uh, you know, capitalism is a gun pointed at the head of global civilization. If you read the theoreticians of capitalism, Adam Smith and so forth, capitalism assumes an unlimited exploitable frontier. There is no such creature. So it has turned pathological. The only frontier now left to exploit is not a frontier in space, but a frontier in time. We steal the future from our children by plunging massively deeper and deeper into debt. But this frontier, the end, is in sight. And we, when we hit that wall, uh, you know, uh, we will join uh, the Eastern Bloc in a fundamental reappraisal of our situation. Democracy, I believe in. I mean, I think democracy is the psychedelic form of government because I don't see it as a product of rational thought. I see it as institutionalized anarchy. It's uh, democracy is biology managed for human purposes. You know, it honors the biological unit. Uh, it takes the biological unit and gives it a vote. And that's a way for Mother Nature to then enter into human history. I mean, I'm fairly mystical about democracy, sort of like William Blake. Uh, what about the experiment in China on uh, one, one uh, um, child, one woman? Well, I think it was very coercive, and I think it shows that uh, it, it's silly to preach it to poor women in rural populations. You want to preach it to educated urban women uh, who, who can evaluate it uh, from many different points of view. You don't want it to be coercive. I think if, the, if you tried to do it from the top down, meaning through these college-educated wealthy women first, that the visible benefit of it would make it uh, the very chic thing to do throughout the world. The reason people have large families in the third world is because they fear for their security in their old age. Uh, you must provide an alternative to that anxiety that is believable or they're not going to go for it, you know. Here as well, not just in the... Here as well. I think, you know, that we have to deconstruct, consciously deconstruct this constipated classical industrial, linear, uh, dominator civilization that we're trapped inside because it's a vehicle we can't steer. It's glued to the tracks which run right over the cliff. If we cannot alter the assumptions of this society, if the George Bushes and Helmut Kohls of this world are going to continue to run things, then, you know, head for the bunkers, folks, and pray because the bunkers aren't going to be any consolation. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm listening very closely to you for a few days. Um, <laughs> And uh, I hear what you're saying here, and I'm trying to formulate a question. I guess my question is, and maybe it's a political question, um, because there's so many people who at this moment, although they recognize that not all is well in Dodge, um, you know, they're reasonably comfortable still. They have a certain amount of uh, self-image and wealth and personality invested in this terrible corrupt system and by and large they're the ones who are at the reins and control the resources you know how does the archaic revival be made attractive and seductive and pleasurable and ecstatic to these people especially not to mention you know the influx of sort of Latino economic refugees into the country who just want a television set, man. 
Yeah, well, this is a real problem that the third world people can only aspire to the example they've been given, and it's an example of consumerism and uh, and so forth. Uh, and it's an, may I just say? As yeah, well, go ahead. It's an example not only of consumerism, but of a certain freedom and liberation of human expressiveness and spirit that they perceive. You know, it's not all that people are fucked up. You know, they look at America and this consumer culture, and they see the good parts, you know. Well, I think that you can't reform human nature. So what we have to do then is dematerialize the culture in some way. And I I don't talk too much about this because, frankly, I haven't really got a clue as to how you would do that. I mean, I know there's nanotechnology and so forth and so on. But what we need to do is take the matter out of thingdom so that everybody can live in the Frank Lloyd Wright waterfall house. I mean, you it costs $9.95 and you buy it at the 7-Eleven and take it home and slap it on and you can live in it. Uh, so that's why I'm interested... That's why I, in spite of my nature boy thrust in most contexts, I'm very interested in virtual reality and the idea of making the imagination explicit or interiorizing the exterior world. I mean, one vision that I've had of a kind of future utopia is, uh, you know, it... It opens on a world which looks like our world of 10,000 years ago. I mean, people live tribally, they are physically perfect, they are naked, they want for nothing, but they appear to have no material culture whatsoever. Then when you shift your point of view so that you're inside one of these people's heads, you discover that when they close their eyes, there are menus hanging in space in front of them. And by uh, glancing at these menus with a certain intensity, they are able to make their way into a culture that is entirely three-dimensionally present for them, but which nowhere impinges on the world of three-dimensional space. It's sort of the idea that you could have the Vatican Library installed uh, optionally when you have dental work, you know, and then just by pushing your tongue over there, why uh, you could uh, view uh, the Fabrianos or whatever. Uh, I don't think this is that far-fetched. I mean, a lot of money is going toward this. Uh, uh, Money can be made from this. And remember, I was saying that we have to figure out, hang the rascals, then we're going to have to figure out some way to make money out of saving the world so that capitalism can cease its rapacious destruction of things. And I think these entertainment technologies are the way to go. I think that what we should all be trading in in 15 or 20 years from now is ideas. And ideas should be worth more than anything. And uh, this is happening. I mean, I was impressed. At this. We, there was a virtual reality conference here last summer, and a number of people came from Fujitsu. And the Japanese are not dragging their ass on this stuff the way we are. They understand what it is. And they, Fujitsu has a research team of 30 people who work full-time on virtual reality. And their sampling, data sampling rates and their equipment was far superior to anything here. Um, The Japanese culture is an excellent model for this future that we're trying to move into because what the Japanese seem to understand that nobody else understands is they've had centuries of experience with limited resource management. And, you know, our style is, you know, cut it down, dig it out, and when it's gone, move on. And now we're at the end of our rope with that. We have to manage this thing like a spaceship, uh, limited resources. Yeah. Uh.